were to study the Bible? All day long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you were like, I wonder if I have what it takes to be the director of Scout History. There you go. All right, Sherry. I like to start first thing in the morning with just listening to the Word of God and, and meditating it and do my study of the Lord later in the day, especially when I need to prepare for something. I like evenings or like super evenings, so like the first one to read the Bible in the morning. I only study the Bible Sunday mornings at 7 (laughs) o'clock. No, I I prefer the morning and the different times of the day. I kind of have two morning times uh, that I do it. It's kind of weird. I like the morning with a cup of tea and then the evening right before bed. Okay. How many chapters do you read usually in the study, Aaron? I read the Bible in the morning early, uh, and I just read, and I make notes of anything I want to go back to. But then I study throughout the day. But when I read, I usually am reading probably three to six chapters. Three to four chapters. Yep. Yes. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, I would say I read about six, um, but I usually study one. Yeah, I I focus on three chapters a day. Uh, I go a chapter a week, uh, nice and in-depth, nice and slow. And then at the night, I read the Sermon on the Mount. What was the question? No. I, I mean, at, at home, this is this is my primary study Bible I, I, I use at home. Then I have uh, different uh, Bibles. I, I enjoy studying the Bible with the Bible, so different translations uh, I kind of use as a study Bible as well. Uh, the Amplified Bible is a great assistance for me in studying. And then there's, uh, uh, it's, it's more of a commentary, but it has all the scripture in it. It's, it's uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's... Uh, Sermon outline, Bible, and then Matthew Henry's, correct? And then I have a huge uh, Bible program uh, that's just amazing. I uh, love my study Bible. I love Blue Letter Bible. I have it on my phone, and it's also a desktop site. It's a great way to go into the original language in a way that is accessible for someone who doesn't know the original language super well. Uh, it's a great resource. And then I love podcasts. I listen to nonstop tons of podcasts every day. A Bible Project podcast, whenever I have, like, really want to go in-depth on a topic, I go there. And then Knowing Faith podcast is another great one, and they do kind of more topical theology questions and more in-depth Bible study. It's a great uh, popular-level theology that kind of takes all the complicated terms and puts them on a level that uh, normal people can understand. And the Blue Letter Bible that you listed... Yeah, I, there's another resource I think is, is great for devotion time and studying uh, your Bible uh, is is something I enjoy. I just listen to it. It's called Drive Time Devotion. You can get the app for it. Um, and it's it's a great just devotion time just to, just to hear the Word of God. I really enjoy it. On Bible Gateway, like you said, a lot of the commentaries that you pay to use, but one that's very good is called Matthew Henry, and it's free on Gateway. You go on the right
first came to mind when I read that question was that I want to be sure I don't spend more time in the guides and in the helps than I do in the actual word itself. I try to focus first on just in the word and praying before I'm going to see what other people say about it. And I want to make sure that I don't uh, let them speak to me before God himself comes to speak to me in the word. Uh, for me, it's time. Uh, that's part of the kind of curse of going to study at night, but carving out time for it, I'm definitely guilty of pushing it back until it's so late and so tired. And it's just not enough. So sometimes you do study your Bible in the morning. Early, early morning. Very early. Um, I, I think the, the most difficult challenge for me was, uh, was my reading difficulty. Some of you who have known me for years, I used to talk about it quite a bit, and then my Aunt Esther told me to never talk about it. So I listened to her once, and, uh, and, uh, and so that was one of my difficulties kind of, I, I, I grew up, and, and so this is hard to imagine maybe because I read the Bible on Sunday mornings, is I grew up with a, a reading difficulty in comprehension. So sometimes when you hear a message, the reason it, it, it sounds so fresh and new on my heart, because it is. Uh, I, I don't remember from before. And so I, I look at it as a blessing that I, I can look at the Word of God and it can just be so fresh. And I wanted to share with you, I asked Pastor Gabe if I could share this. I, I had struggles just really comprehending the Word of God as, as a young man and as a teenager. And my mom and dad bought me this uh, Taylor's Bible Story book. And you can see it's well used. I didn't even read the Bible. I first started reading Bible stories. And, uh, and then I could go back and find out where they were. And you can judge me for that or whatever. But, but this really got me connected, and it went through the Bible in order. And for someone who doesn't have uh, a, a master's degree in a four-year study and a master's degree and now in master's study, just the pastor, uh, real guy here, um, it, it was, for me, it was that. And then... The, the most critical thing is when, you, when you're studying God's word and you don't get something, uh, is just simply stop and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And, uh, and you can read some notes. I'm with Sherry. You can focus on the word, not the, not the other studies. Focus on the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will direct you and lead you uh, far greater than you would, would, ever, would ever know or imagine. It's incredible. Yeah, and I'll piggyback on that real quick because I know like we got some youth in the audience. There's no shame in not understanding the Bible. There's no shame in starting at step one. Like everyone up here started with zero knowledge of the Bible when we started studying. And so there's no shame if you're like, man, I don't even know where Genesis is. That's okay. And it's, it's page one. But that's okay if you don't even know that. That's totally fine and not a problem. Um. Okay, I'll hop back and make some adjustments. If you're watching at home, we're going to try to adjust this, and uh, we apologize for that. And we, you are super important to us, and so we're going to try to make these adjustments real quick. Yeah, so no shame if you don't understand. Everyone starts with nothing. No one starts knowing a ton of stuff. Uh, probably one of my biggest struggles as a young guy is having a habit of reading the Bible. Uh, something, honestly, that didn't start in my life until about a couple years ago where I had a really consistent habit of, like, daily, regular Bible reading. And so young people, like, or old people, like, start a habit and just stick with it, make a schedule, grind it out, even when it's boring, even when it, even when it sucks. That's not hypocrisy. That's called faithfulness. So start a habit, make it just part of your life. somebody just beginning, I would recommend something like the book of Mark. It's very fast reading, a lot of action, and it'll keep you engaged. Good place to start. I agree. I, I think Mark or John, and we're studying John at church, um, but Mark, one of the Gospels 
and those two I think are the easiest to start with and re and do. If you want to just start going verse by verse in another book to just look for uh, go slow, I would recommend Philippians chapter four. There's a lot of well-known verses there, and as you start through it, you'll recognize them. It'll be fun to recognize and delve deeper into those verses too. Real quick, we're gonna keep Sherry. It's Mike on Dan and Sherry. And then Okay, keep using the mic. Um, I, I would say um, John, and the reason I say John is because we're in John, and you you would, I don't know if you realize the great gift you have, that pastor is going to take significant time to go through the Gospel of John as a church, and then so far every week he said, read this chapter or these few verses every single day this week, and you might look at that and be like, well, why? I read it the day before, because if you actually read it and press into it, you'll get more out of it every single day. Um, e even today, I was on John 1, 1 through 5, and I was just blown away by things I was learning. And so take time, t make notes, study the assigned reading, journal your thoughts, and ask questions. I keep saying that, but you should be sending texts into us, anyone up here, just asking questions of, hey, I didn't get this, or I think I got this, is this correct? And, and that would help you a lot. But I would encourage you to spend 2021 just mastering the Gospel of John. Of course, I'm the oddball. I, I, I enjoy the Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, I, you know, I was a carpenter, so practical things uh, for me are, are super good, and those are things you can go to as far as uh, in, in the Gospels. I, I enjoy the Gospels uh, very much. How many times did you say if you read our reading assignment, you had done the math, if they read a chapter every day, they'd read the book 15 times, they'd read the Gospel of John? You, you, then you'll get up and teach and preach. And I'll comment for Adam. Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's everything Jesus ever taught came out of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a summary of his teaching. So let's start with Jesus. We're all sharing up here. Sharing is caring. You're like sharing um, now. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the longer questions here. Um, and uh, we're going to basically try to answer these first, and then a couple of us will just maybe jump off of it, things that come to mind. Um, but one of the questions that came in was, do you have any suggestions or examples of a beginner's Bible study, maybe for a group of unbelievers or baby Christians, uh, what book should be taught first? Just kind of want to jump off that. Um, I, I kind of shared earlier, I guess maybe that's why it was in my, in my head, and, and, and I brought this. Um, to, to study the Bible, as we, we've all kind of answered uh, that question, um, a beginner's study Bible would, I mean, this is beginner's end-end -end study Bible. This is just a great, the Bible that Gabe is giving away is just a, a great Bible. Um, there's also some New Living Translations, especially as a beginner. I love reading the New Living Translation when I'm just listening to the Word of God on, on the on the YouVersion app. Um, I, I enjoy listening to it in the New Living Translation. And uh, they add a little music in the background stuff, too. It's kind of cool. Um, and, and right now, I, a simple uh, reading plan. In the U version app, could be very helpful. Right now, I started off the the year with Psalms and Proverbs, and just kind of hitting that. I, I love the Psalms and Proverbs; they're just really encouraging to me, and and bless me. My my parents always said, if nothing else, read a proverb a day because there's 31 of them. You got one for every day of the month, and uh, and 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 I and enjoy that. And then if you're you're just beginning to set it, I I would highly recommend the Drive Time Devotion app. Um, do any of you listen to the Drive Time Devotion app? Okay, my family. All right, the Carlson. Uh, it, it's just a, a great, a great app. It's about they they range from ten to fifteen minutes um, a day, Monday through Friday. They don't do Saturday and Sunday, but it, it's just a just a simple study of getting into the to the Word of God, and that's a great uh, place uh, to to start as a beginning, and then and then work up from there. I I thoroughly enjoy it.
Well, we know that Jesus is in the Old Testament because Jesus, after his resurrection, told his disciples, it says he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And then he said again to his disciples, uh, he explained to them about the things written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So there are things in the Old Testament about Jesus. We see Christ is promised in the Old Testament. There's some over 300 promises that are given to us, very explicit promises regarding his uh, genealogy, his birthplace, being born of a virgin, details regarding his life, regarding his death. Uh, and there are many good study books that will help bring out those where those different prophecies are located. Uh, Christ is not only promised in the Old Testament, he is patterned in the Old Testament. In the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, uh, remember how John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A uh, picture from the Old Testament sacrificial system. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been slain. So pictured in that feast as well. And there's many other places where Christ is patterned or pictured. And then Christ is present in the Old Testament as well. In the Old Testament, there's theophany appearances of God. And theologians believe that those are actually appearances pre-incarnate uh, appearances of Christ. And there are times when uh, the angel of the Lord will say, addressing himself as Lord, and then he'll speak to his Lord. So it shows us something very unique is happening there uh, in relationship to the Godhead and Trinity. Uh, in Jude 1.5, there's an interesting verse that says, Jesus saved a people out of Egypt. And in 1 Corinthians 10.4, it says they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. I think the best way to see Christ in the Old Testament is get familiar with the New Testament and see how the New Testament refers back to Jesus in the Old Testament. And that's the safest way and best way, I think, to see Jesus in the Old Testament. This is one of the real good reasons to have a study Bible, um, because while you could take a long time to learn all of the New Testament. I think that's great, but a study Bible, most study Bibles uh, will tell you this reference that this is reference to the Old Testament, or they'll help you find that. And that's one of the benefits of a study Bible. Any other thoughts? All right. Um, how do I avoid becoming too dependent on supplemental material? Spurgeon said this quote that's well known for, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. Amen. Visit good books, but live in the Bible. So you can visit good books, whether that's a commentary or even the bottom part of a study Bible or even just a regular novel that's a good, uh, decent book, but live in the Bible. So I think Sherry talked about how, how grandma, she just really wants to live there. She wants to just read the Bible. When, when most people are sitting in the DMV, they're, they're reading through the newspaper or a novel or they're on the social media. She's living in the Bible. So I think developing that practice, and I definitely um, need to be reminded of this. Uh, I quickly, because there's so many tools near me, I quickly can grab a tool really quick, uh, whether that's a commentary or a podcast or something. I have to be reminded, no, I need to get first just the Bible. And so I, as I thought of the question, there's a few things that, that came to mind of how do I make sure I'm not doing that. One, I would say, pray and trust the Holy Spirit to reveal. When you pray, we talked about this at this meeting all the time, always pray before you study, and then trust that the Holy Spirit is going to, to open your mind. He's going to turn the light on in your eyes to understand what you're reading. And, and then two, I would work hard to get it. A lot of people just give up too quick. They go, it's just too hard. I just don't get it. I would spend more time. I would spend longer. We, we quickly look for answers and forget the value of showing our work. I have a second grader. <laughs> um, and uh, he has to show his work and everyone hates showing their work but it's so valuable and so doing the hard work of trying and writing things down taking a pen with you, a piece of paper with you journaling, writing out your questions asking people around you asking people on the stage people in your, your groups, your home questions it is super is super valuable so I would at least do those, those two things and I think if you keep those two things in mind, it'll, it'll keep you centered on the Lord. 
I think one of the things, the best commentary on, on the Bible is the Bible. And, uh, and, to, and to really focus on that, uh, one of the things Sherry said, and I don't think I have it memorized, but uh, one of the examples I had as a young person is to put on your gospel specs. Instead of sometimes going to a commentary is to take a portion of scripture and put on your, your gospel specs. Is there any sins to hold your mic, right? You just taught it last week. Just keep going. Promises to claim, examples to follow, commands to obey. Very good. See, that's why she taught it last week. So, uh, and, and sometimes just going through that verse and letting that verse, instead of going to the commentary to look for the answer, is there. And then one of the things that was on my heart was Gabe was saying, is just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I really appreciate this question because I think it's important that as a teacher who is trained to be a teacher, I know that everybody learns differently. Some of you will learn best by talking it over with someone, and some of you will learn best by having the way I learn best is to or or organize the information with an outline in some way that helps me put structure to it, and then I get it, and you see that in the study. Asked informational. I really think that Bible, though informational, is always designed to be transformational. And we have to look for what God wants to do through it, not just information. And I think that this, there's got to be in our lives a combination of this. I don't know that. I think the problem with discussion, the thing that's important, it's not a problem. But you need to know that somebody's going to keep track of getting us to come to the right conclusion. Someone has to be, if you're just going to discuss it and leave out there unknown and everybody goes away and says, well, who was right? And it has to line up with the word of God. So we need someone to bring that to that. The same thing with questions and answers, because you have to have the right answers. And that's important in those, those things. As far as theologically rich, I think that um, what we just said about not getting too focused on Supplemental materials that letting the Bible interpret the Bible initially is important. I don't think just theology for the sake of theology. I think it's important, though, that we um, engage the Word of God in the way that we'll start to learn. And if you say, well, I've tried listening and I don't get it all as good, then maybe try one of the other things or look, look for something the way you learn. Most of us, by the time we get to be our age, have an idea of the way we learn. And I, and I think that it's okay to have some combination of this, but the most important thing is to study the Word of God and look at it as the truth and not our discussion or anything else. Yeah. I think I'll just jump off that and say um, the word the theology, that it, I think it makes a lot of Christians nervous or gets them really excited. Just keep in, your, in mind that everyone has a theology of God. Your neighbor, whatever faith or not faith they are, they have an idea of God. They think something about God. They have views about God. So if, not that we need to be theologically rich, but you need to understand that as it's transforming you, it is transforming your understanding of God. It should be. It is shaping your theology. So you might say, well, I'm no theologian. No, you are. You really are. And so is your neighbor, even if they don't go to church. You're a theologian. And so you should, when you study the Bible, go, okay, I need to get this. Because I have a view of God, and I want it to be this view of God. And so that's the, don't get too freaked out by the word. Realize you're all theologians. Everyone has a view of God, even your neighbor, regardless of faith. Yeah. All right. Um, how do I choose a Bible translation? Um, to jump on that. Uh, so it's good to remember there's kind of two broad categories of Bible translations, how the Bible works. There's a what's called dynamic or thought for thought translation, and there is formal or word for word translation. And so these are useful for different things. And so I'd ask you I'd ask you back the question, how do you want to use your Bible when you're studying it? So if you're studying like a, a book or a chapter or a long passage, uh, something more dynamic, thought for thought, is going to be more helpful there because it's going to give you the broad stroke picture of what's going on in this passage, what's this really saying, what does it mean? So in this case, something like the New Living Translation, the New International Version, those are going to be more helpful here because they're more uh, broad 
thought for thought translations. If you want to go really in-depth on individual words or just a couple verses and really dive deep, uh, you're going to want a word-for-word -word or a formal translation, something like the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible. These can be more helpful in getting a really accurate, in-depth picture. So I study with an ESV in front of me, and then I have my NASB on one side when I want to go really deep in on a word, and I have my NLT on the other side when I want to get kind of a broad picture. Yeah. And in like BibleGateway.org, you can literally go in there and put John 1, 1 through 5, and then you can click parallel it, give me the ESV, give me the NASV, give me the NLT, and it'll show you them side by side. You can make the font as big or as small as you want. You have literally every translation available to you for free on the internet. And so you can get these translations in the new version Bible. In the new version Bible. Yeah, and, and I would say that uh, that that's one of those things that you don't need to worry about. Uh, you need to, to just focus on your relationship with God. If people in church spent more time uh, looking into the heavens and to God instead of looking side by side in the, the pew next to them of what someone else is doing, uh, they'd be a, a, lot, a lot better off in, in, uh, in working in that direction. So just remember, we're all different. I stand up here today and admit to you, as your pastor, and that I started with reading this, and uh, and and it was a battle for me. Uh, when I first became a pastor and and pastored as a lead pastor, uh, I had no Bible school experience whatsoever. Uh, I graduated from Bible school when I was younger than Karen. Karen was. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, we graduated the same year, and so I felt better than, than her. So, so uh, no. Uh, and, 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 and so when I was a pastor, I, the biggest question I was afraid of, if, if someone asked me, what was, what's your education? And uh, believe me, the devil tried to attack me. The devil tried to attack me and said, you can't do it. It's not. You know, you don't have the ability to do it, but uh, he had the ability. He gave me the calling, not, not, not other people. And so the very first time I was asked, someone said to me, man, I enjoy coming to your church and the preaching of the word of God, and you hug me, and, and you love us. And, and, uh, and, I, and he said, he, he asked me, he said, you know, where would you study at? You know, 33 years of Sunday school. And, and he goes, really? You've never been to seminary? And I said, no, 33 years of summer school. He goes, he looks at me and he goes, oh, I don't care. I love it here. <laughs> so, so but, but listen, we, can't, we just worry about our relation. That's why it's a relationship with God and, and, and we have a relationship with others on, on an earthly level. But our, our spirit is a relationship uh, with, with God. And just, man, if you just take a verse a day to start, and begin and say, Lord, would you speak to me through this verse? Would you fill me? And then you get to a place. And one of the things I love to do if I come through a portion of Scripture is I stop and I worship the Lord. And I, and, and I just say, Lord, what, what, do you, what do you got for me out of this? You know, what are you, what are you speaking to me? And, and truth is revealed. And, and, and it comes. And so uh, don't worry about other people. Don't worry about where they're at. And there's probably a good chance that when you saw them, they were putting on a show or they were preparing uh, uh, deeply for that moment uh, to share. So when you go into, say, a, a, a small discussion, you go to a community group or someone shares something about they've prepared for that time. They've shared usually, you know, and so they got a little more insight than you. So don't feel like, well, why didn't I understand that or why didn't I get that? I feel that all the time. These, the, you know, these theologians on this, on the, well, we're all, the, I'm a theologian. <laughs> Sit up straighter. The theologians, <laughs> theologian on this stage. But those, those things, when I heard Dan say he couldn't remember a verse, I mean, when I first met Dan, I thought the letters in red were his. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just joking. No, but I mean, there's different gifts that people have and abilities. There's people who can study the Word of God. 
I would never for all of my days ever think about getting a master's degree. That's kooky. What a waste of time, right? <laughs> but that's not me. That's him, right? That's him. And, and so we, we got to understand that God made all of us different, and you're going to grow different. The important part is that you grow. That's the important part, and that you put in the effort to grow. I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for. Because it's more anointed. Um, <laughs> joking. Um, <laughs> no, no, that was super good. And uh, can you just give it up for your pastor? He worked hard to study and... Um, I, I like to say we're lifelong students of the Bible, so it doesn't matter if you're behind. There's no test on Friday, right? You just keep working at it, get good, get better at it every single day. And if it takes all week to learn one verse, that's a great week, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and, and so just keep going at it. And uh, hey, it, there's no test. <laughs> you're you're good. Just keep studying the Word of God. So anyone else want to jump off that? Yeah, I'll hop in. One of the things my dad always said, my dad's a pastor as well, he always said it might take 20 years to get to the point where it feels like, man, I kind of understand it. You can either spend 20 years like grinding and, and working at it, and it's going to be hard work, but then in 20 years, you'll know something. Or you can say, I'd ah, take 20 years, I'm not going to bother, and in 20 years, you'll be right where you are now. So do the work, take the time, get there. I just want to just say, if, like Pastor said, when you see me teach for an hour, it means I studied for five or six. So what I'm saying is you might think, oh, they know all this. They have all this knowledge at their fingertips. But we've studied when we're going to present it. So he's made a good point that they're prepared for what they say because they studied. So it took a while. They're, they're struggling to hear you, so make sure you, you kiss the mic. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, even <laughs> even um, even tonight, you're like, man, they're getting these answers out quick. They were sent to everyone in advance. They were assigned who's answering what. We're not that good. Um, okay, next question in. This was assigned to Sherry. What should I pray before I read my Bible? First thing I would encourage all of us to pray is for focus. I think distractions are what we can pray away. And sometimes we don't do that, and then we get all distracted. I think the next thing to pray for is understanding. And I think that the Lord, the Holy Spirit was sent to help us understand the Bible. It's to be our guide. So pray and ask, say, Lord, help me to understand what I read. And I think what we don't always pray about that we need to pray about is that we want to ask the Lord to give us a heart to obey and to not only understand it, but to desire to do it. What I say is read the Bible with the intent of obeying it. And that's what I pray for, for focus, for understanding, and for a heart that wants to obey it. Yeah, I would say the prayer of salvation and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And no, I, I say that uh, as, uh, no, w when you read the, the Bible, you should, you're not really going to understand it to receive Jesus Christ. There was a, a pastor that uh, was taught, taught for years and uh, in the Bible study in a church, and uh, he actually received Jesus Christ about 10 years after he had been teaching Every week in the church, he finally received Jesus Christ in teaching the book of, book of James. And so just make sure your relationship with Jesus and begin uh, that way. But, you know, I just say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. And then, and then the hard part is, is listening to him, not what you think you should listen to, and respond in that way. And, and to focus, I think it's very good that you take time to focus. So as soon as the very first time that you say, okay, I'm going to sit this down, you have your notepad, the very first thing when you begin to study is something's going to come to your mind you have to do. So write it down and say, thank you, Lord, for reminding me of that. And then, no, because the enemy wants to distract you, right? That's all the enemy wants. So pray that you can focus. I think that's a very important part and where people get off track. We're grateful that Pastor Gabe finally got saved. That's um, good. It's a great series. <laughs> there's a, that was my joke. <laughs> I, I know. I got ahead of you. Uh, there's no shame if you're like, man, 
I don't know how to pray. Like, they're telling me, what, well, like, what words do I use? I pray the same prayer every single morning. I'm literally going to read it to you. I have it written in my phone. There's nothing wrong with a rote prayer. The point is that you mean the words, not that they're original or spontaneous. Um, so I pray this every single morning. Lord, as I open your word, would you open my heart to receive what you have for me? Give me eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart willing to obey your voice. Help me see what you've written to the church for all ages, and now, through your spirit, apply its message to my heart. And I pray that every single time, and that's totally okay that you just, but it, the point is you're praying, you're engaging the spirit, and you're inviting the Lord to help you understand the words. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. Uh, next question, this is for, we're going to send this your way, Dan. How do I relate Greek and get deeper into the word? I think the best tool for in-depth biblical studies is the original languages. Someone has said that uh, when you read a translation, it's like kissing your bride through the veil. <laughs> There's something unique and special about getting into the original languages. However, we realize that not everybody has that opportunity. Come to Bible college, we'll give you that opportunity. <laughs> However, Shameless plug. <laughs> do know that those who have translated our scriptures are people who are uh, real scholars and experts in Greek and Hebrew, and they have done the very best job trying to communicate that back to us in our language. So you can rely and trust on the uh, good translations that are available to us. Also, there's many great commentaries that are available that get in uh, depth into scripture. But I would just caution you, if you don't know the original languages, don't pretend like you do and talk about what the Hebrew says and the Greek says. Leave that to the scholars to deal with that because it's easy to misrepresent what's being said. I don't think there's a week that goes by when I listen to the radio that I don't hear somebody talk about the Greek or Hebrew and I say, well, they kind of missed it on that one. Uh, so use good helps, and, but don't think that you're your scholar. And then I want to say this too. There's a principle in biblical interpretation that's called the clarity of Scripture. And the, the principle is this, that God has made Scripture understandable to the qualified interpreter. And the qualified interpreter is the person who's born again. So God will help you understand his word. You don't need to know Greek or Hebrew to understand Scripture. The main things of Scripture are the plain things in Scripture. The plain things in Scripture are the main things in Scripture. And you can trust your good translation to communicate to you what God has said to us in his word. Okay? So Greek and Hebrew is a, a fun thing for those that go in deep and, and want to teach at Bible schools. But uh, understand that you can be a qualified uh, understander of Scripture because of this principle, the clarity of Scripture. Good. Um, all right. Uh, it's on. Um, why read the Old Testament if we aren't under the Old Covenant? Adam? So I'm a nerd, and so I'm going to make a Star Wars reference. If I sit you down and say, hey, I want you to see it's just the greatest story ever. It's emotional. It's powerful. It's incredible. Sit down and watch this. And I'm going to show you the last 20 minutes of Return of the Jedi. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sorry. It's kind of too late. Um, you're going to see Darth Vader kill the Emperor. You'll see uh, Luke un take off Darth Vader's mask and like the big bad guy like sees his son face to face. You'll see the Death Star explode. It's this powerful, awesome, incredible scene. But if you haven't watched episodes four, five, and all of six leading up to that moment, it's going to kind of... It's going to be a little dull. You'll, you'll definitely watch it. You'll understand the story beats. And you'll say, yeah, that was cool. That was awesome. But why should I really care? And that's what happens when we only read the New Testament or only read the gospel without understanding all the story that came before it. It's like watching the last 20 minutes of Return of the Jedi. And that last 20 minutes is awesome. And it makes the whole rest of the story worth it. If that last 20 minutes is, isn't there, there's no point in watching the first few movies. So, like, I'm not trying to undercut the New Testament or say the Old Testament is more important, but that uh, if we don't have the Old Testament, we are going to misunderstand everything going on in the New Testament. We will misrepresent Jesus, and we'll, we'll actually misunderstand and misrepresent his mission and his work in the world. So, 
Uh, I would just add to that that we're we're in a day and age where the Old Testament is kind of under fire right now. Um, even pastors are saying, like, let's unhitch ourselves from it. And um, and so it's the authoritative word of God. The Old Testament is just as authoritative as the New Testament. The Old Testament is just as authoritative as the words in red in your New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's the authoritative word of God. So just for that fact alone, I think Adam's answer was great. But just for that fact alone, read it, fight to, to read it, love to read it, and realize that it's under attack right now. And so we need to make sure that at, at least for ourselves and for this church, we're always going back to the Old Testament. Uh, it is the very word of God, so we want to cling to it. And, and we're not the first generation to be challenged by the Old Testament. Uh, this has happened in the, like the 400s. Martian came up with this whole idea of let's get rid of the Old Testament. We don't need it anymore. So this isn't a new idea. We aren't the first Christians to like be confused by commands in the Old Testament. Every generation of Christian has wrestled with these questions, and every generation of Christians have been guided by the Spirit, and they found the answers. And so they are there. They, they've been there since the beginning of church history. They're going to continue to be there. So, like, don't get freaked out when you see some YouTube video of some guy who's like, hey, here's all these terrible laws about women and children and people in the Old Testament. God's stupid. Don't follow the Old Testament. Don't follow God. That's not a new thing. That's been around for over a thousand years. And wise, brilliant Christians have answered it for over a thousand years. I just want to say that if you wonder about that, if it's really how God intended, if you read the book of Hebrews, the book mm -hmm. of Hebrews in the New Testament goes back. I love to teach at the Bible college. Sometimes I teach wanderings in the wilderness and then Hebrews because they are so connected. And if the Bible does that, it's very clear that that is to part, they're to be interacting together. Good. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that's that's super important. I think what is Dan would probably know the answer that Psalms is is quoted most of any uh, Old Testament Bible, and then Isaiah after that in the New Testament, and and it, and it just connects back and forth. It's reinforcing the Old Testament is is girding up the New Testament. Awesome. Wow, that was we yeah, we all like wow. Good job. Okay. Um, next question that came in that we, we assigned to me is, is how do I know that God is there, is there with me? Uh, how do I know that God is there with me? Um, and, and I kind of talked about this week one, but God um, wants to be known. <laughs> and so the very fact that God is all powerful, all good, and always present, he's all present, and he wants to be known, and he makes himself known through his written word, through the Bible. And so you get to 2 Timothy 3.16, which all of us use as our big launching verse, that all scriptures breathe out by God. This is the word of God. So engaging with the word is present with the capital W word. You're present with God. He is there with you. He's speaking to you in the way he chose to reveal himself to you through the written word. He wants to be known. And so the whole point of the Bible is to know God. That's why we have it. The whole point of the Bible is uh, that, that he would point us to Jesus, that you might know him. And so he's with you. Uh, he's with you generally, but he's, he's with you because he wants to reveal himself to you. And if you're, if you're struggling with this, whoever asked this question, or maybe you've wondered this too, I, I would encourage you, read Psalm 119. And you're like, all of it? Yeah, all of it. Read Psalm 119. Don't, don't, you don't have to memorize it. Just read it. Um, Read Psalm 119, and the psalmist is praying for, and he's obviously receiving illumination of the scripture. He's saying, oh, that I would know, oh, that I would desire, oh, that I would have this. I love your law, I love your precepts. These things, that's all coming through in a very raw way, a way that we think, a way we pray, we journal. So read Psalm 119, and, and then you've heard this a lot too, but we're told to ask for the spirit to be present and to help us, and he does. Um, God doesn't give you commands. He doesn't give you instructions that you would fail at them. He's trying to guide you and lead you and love you, and he's trying to make himself known. So he is with you. Um, so you know he's with you because it's his very word. He wants to be known, and you have the, the helper to help you along the way. I've heard a pastor say, you want to hear the voice of God? Read the Bible. You want to hear the audible voice of God? Read the Bible out loud. As we read these words, this is literally, you could think of it as God the Father speaking to God the Son, and you get to listen in through the power of God the Holy Spirit. Like, God is with you because you have 
the Bible. He's right, not like the, the Bible doesn't have like the spirit in it. Like we, you understand what I'm saying. But as we read those words, it is God with us present. Yeah, on that thought, the next question. So if you want to hear the voice of God, read the Bible. You want to hear it out, uh, audibly, read it out loud. The next question is what, what's the best way to hear God's voice other than the Bible? Or should the Bible be our only source of hearing the voice of God? And we're sending that. Yeah, I mean, if any other source uh, doesn't line up with the Bible, then that's not a good source. So you can have people say, I got a word from the Lord for you. And that could be fine. I've, I've had a word for the Lord for people over healing. I've had a word for the Lord for those things. And those are things that impact our life. What we have to understand is, is everything must line up with the word of God. There's going to be nothing that's prophesied that's from the Lord. It may be prophesied, but not from the Lord, that, that does not line up with the word of God. This is it. This is the beginning, the end. This is everything. This is what God has given us. And uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to that. And so whatever is spoken, and you can be encouraged in a song and feel God speaking to you in a song. I, I love to worship. I love, and I can, and I, but it's, but what he speaks to me, he ministers to me, he goes back to the foundation in the truth of the word of God. And so uh, what's the best way to, to hear God's voice other than the Bible? I mean, they're, they're, you're going to hear it in worship. You're going to hear it in prayer. You're going to hear it in a still, small voice. You're going to hear it through the proclamation and the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. Those are all things that are going to minister to you. Uh, and 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 help you grow, but it's all going to go back. It's all going to go back to the second part. Uh, the Bible is the source, so everything else is going to go back uh, to the Word of God. Marino Christian Assembly stands on the Word of God. We always will, no matter what happens politically, no matter what happens in our culture, no matter if they come in here and try to destroy us. We will stand on the promises and the truth of God's Word, and we will not fail. As per conversation with Armando Castro in my driveway today. <laughs> Armando Corral, not Castro. <laughs> is, is he alive? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Armando. Man, we gave you the toughest question, and you did great, but then after the question. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a long conversation with uh, the driveway. Great. Um, okay, how, this is a, a good question. And I'm glad we're getting to it. We got a little bit of time. How did they figure out? Um, oh wait, is this? I'm skipping ahead. What does praying according to the Lord's will look like? What does praying according to the Lord's will look like? Um, and, and my answer to that is, and I, I don't know why Christians struggle with this so much. If you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. What's my calling? What's God's will for my life? Next week we're starting a series called "The Call of God." <laughs> what you're called to do as a believer. Um, Spoiler alert, it's not as crazy spiritual as you think. It's in the written word of God. And so what does it look like to pray the Lord's will? What does that look like? And I would say a, a phrase, pray the scriptures back to God. Pray the scriptures. And, and I say that because um, as you begin to understand the scriptures, you, you pray them back to God because they are his words. They are his will. It's like a kid saying, well, dad, you said, right? Mom, you told me. It's like, oh, I did say, right? Like, not that God needs to be reminded, but we can know that when we're in God's word and when we pray God's word, we're praying the, the will of God. We see the early church doing this, like Acts 4 uh, pops, c comes to mind and when, you, when they're praying back to God the scriptures. And then virtually all of the Bible will lead us to praise God, thank God, cry out to God, or confess something to God. It, it is tough to find a section of scripture that's not gonna cause you to do some sort of interaction with God. Um, so that involves praise, as Pastor said. It involves prayer, gratitude, these things. So you engage and you pray the Lord's will by praying the scriptures. And, and you know, I, I thought it might be helpful. I just took up a memory verse thing. If, if you just read a scripture, and then at the end of it, you're like, okay, I want to pray. Let the scripture guide your prayer. So for instance, just week one, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. 
So you can take a scripture, a verse or two, and say you read that, you're studying that, and you're like, okay, Lord, Lord, help me to realize that I'm blessed because I have your word. Lord, help me. You know that I give in and I, I spend so much time listening to the wicked. I spend so much time listening to my brother, my cousin, uh, my, my neighbor next door, my, my, the guy at my work, and I listen to them so much. Lord, help me to filter through that. Lord, Lord, help me to not stand in the way of sinners. Help direct my steps, guide my feet. I don't want to walk in this direction. Lord, help me to delight in, in your law. Help me to love it. God, sometimes, I, if I'm being honest, I hate your law. Would you help me to delight in it? I don't want to be told these things, but I accept that they're true. God, Lord, would you help me to delight in your law? Lord, meditating is a drag. Would you help me to meditate? I have a 40-minute commute to work. Would you just fill my mind with scriptures instead of the Super Bowl? And, and those are like honest prayers that I might have if I were to be studying the scripture afterwards. Like, God, do this. What you're saying in, in your word, do that in my life. I want this. And so I think you can just pray God's will right back to him. Very good. I, I think uh, it'd be great for Dan to comment on this. There's a great book in the library at Southwest Bible College. I don't remember the name of it, but Dan will. But Dan wrote his thesis. Dan wrote his thesis on the book of prayer. You can check it out at the library. Yes, you can check it out. You wrote a whole thesis? No, that's fine. That was a good answer, Gabe. That's it. All right, cool. If, uh, if those have mysteriously gone missing, I happen to have a copy. Um, I might loan you. Um, okay, um, <laughs> Dan knows he's the next question. So how did they figure out um, what books of the Bible are inspired? All right, now, that's a great question, but it's not a, a simple answer. Yeah. Um, the books of our Bible are inspired not because a group of people or a church council ever got together and declared them to be so. They're inspired because the Holy Spirit inspired them, and the Holy Spirit helped the church to recognize that these were unique and different from any other writings that were on the face of the earth. And so the church cherished them, they gathered them, they shared them, and uh, they became collected together to be a part, to be our Bible. The church did not give birth to the word, but the word gave birth to the church. The scripture is Holy Spirit uh, produced. One of our memory verses, all scripture is inspired by God or is God breathed. And scripture speaks of how uh, no prophecy was made by an act of human will, but men were moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. So it's Holy Spirit produced. It's also God's word proclaimed. The church recognized that this was God's word to them. This was the voice of the apostles speaking to them with apostolic authority. And they sensed the touch of God on these books. And so they cherished them. And it helped them to understand Christ and uh, what they should believe and how they should believe. It met the spiritual needs of the church and the ethical needs of the church. It enabled the church to discern between what was right and what was wrong, truth and error. So it's Holy Spirit produced, God's word proclaimed, and it was also providentially preserved. God said in Jeremiah 1.12 that he's watching over his word to perform it. And he, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the stroke of the law will pass until everything is fulfilled. So God has promised to preserve his word. And even in the New Testament, sometimes you'll read fictitious books that speculate that it took hundreds of years for the Bible to come together, uh, like in the New Testament, two, three hundred years. That's not true. You can read in 2 Peter 3.16 of how Peter writes that uh, regarding Paul's writings, some people were taking Paul's writings and try to, trying to distort them just like they did the rest of Scripture. So that tells us that Peter already understood that all Paul's 13 epistles were Scripture. And Paul, interestingly, quotes in, uh, in uh, 1, Corinthians, or, sorry, 1 Timothy 5.18, he says, Scripture says... You shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. What's significant about that is the first quote is from Deuteronomy. The second quote is from the Gospel of Luke. 
So here, by the time Paul is ending his ministry, he's already saying that the gospel of Luke is our scripture. So how long did it take the church to recognize that these books were inscripturated? No, they received them. They had the touch of God on them. They cherished them. Every now and then you'll listen to like a PBS special and they'll talk about the lost books of the Bible. There are no lost books of the Bible. There were books that were written by heretics that were discarded by Christians and never revered because they didn't have that touch of inspiration on them. So our scripture is totally unique from any other book in the world. That was like strong words. Yeah. I, I like when Dan says heretics. That's the strongest I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just want to encourage you, if you have not, we're not here for the, for the series on dwell. They, it, it reinforces how important the Bible is. The first week when Pastor Gabe talked about that God wanted to give his word to us, all that, listen to that, and then his explanation of how to study the Bible, and mine last week, if you put those together, they're going to lead you down that path to begin Bible study. So if you didn't hear them all, go back and listen. That's the advantage of us having these online. Um, and, and then we, we got, um, our time is up, and we got to give away this Bible. Pastor wants to pray over us before we leave. But we got one question today, kind of off the topic of studying the Bible. Well, we're going to, I'll just answer it real quick, um, and it's, it deserves a longer answer than this. But the question is, what happens to a believer in the moment of death? And uh, God's word says that to be um, uh, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So in death, in the moment of death, as soon as you die, you are in the presence of God. Um, that's the quick answer. There's much more there. Our time is super short. If you ask that and you want more than that, you can come talk to any of us. I think we're going to be available to hang out afterwards. If more questions popped up, pull us aside and talk to us. Um, but we, we do want to answer your questions. And you can ask us questions anytime. I think all our numbers and emails are available readily. We can give them to you. Uh, we want your questions. We don't need a panel discussion to get them all going. So um, feel free to ask those. Um, but before we give away the, the Bible... And before we turn it over to Pastor to pray, can you just give it up for everyone uh, helping out tonight? Well done. And, uh, and the winner of the ESV Study Bible, drum roll please, nice, is Glenda Irby. Glenda Irby. No, you're okay. I'll bring it to you. Don't worry. It's not going anywhere. I took the legs off. Um, all right, Pastor, would you, would you close us in prayer? Amen. Would you simply just lift your hands to the Lord? Lord, as we lift our hands to you, Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, just this series. Uh, when I, I heard some of the, uh, the youth, uh, young people share, and Adam share as I snuck in there from time to time, as the word of God is open in our classrooms and in our pulpits. Lord, I pray that we will be the people of God that will, will carry your word. I pray that this will be a people who will check up on the, uh, uh, on the speaker as they proclaim the word of God. Lord, that, that it will just come and it will just penetrate our hearts and our minds. Lord, that, that as we begin to receive the word of God, in your presence and in the anointing that comes from your word into us, Lord, that it would begin to transform us. If we, if we study your word and it doesn't change our life, it's done no good. So, Lord, I pray that your word will come with power, that it would come with strength, that it would come with transformation, that would move us and change us. So there's a change of heart that we receive the word of God. There's a change of mind that we've studied the word of God and there's a change of action that we would live the word of God. So Lord, I pray that you would fill your people with your word. Lord, I pray that that inspired word of God will come and, and touch our hearts every day. Lord, I pray that we will be the people found in the word of God. And in the days we live in, in times of uncertainty, that we will stand on the promises and the truth of your word. And we know that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. And uh, truth is truth is truth. And so, Lord, we stand on the truth of your word. Lord, uh, bless each one tonight. 
Fill them with your very presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Hey, if you don't own a Bible, we give them out for free. It's like our drug. We love it. Um, so go and sin no more. Sin is not my master. Have a great week.